Hey guys, what's up? It is week 67. I'm going to start this out with, uh, look how ridiculous my hair is. I definitely need a haircut. This is insane. It's been so humid, it's like a corn poof or corn puff on my head. But uh, regardless, I'm going to start this off with some corrections. First, I kept saying uh, Biro instead of Biro. I've met Stephen Biro, and, and I've talked to him, and I know his last name. I don't know why I kept saying Biro. I don't know. And also, I called uh, Marcus Cook Special Effects uh, Company uh, Odyssey Effects instead of Autopsy. I'm a dummy. Sorry about that. Let's hop into the reviews. The first one is from Arrow Video. It is Tideland by Terry Gilliam. Uh, this has Jeff Bridges and Jennifer Tilly in it. Uh, I had never seen it. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with Terry Gilliam. I haven't seen all his movies, but I've seen his uh, trilogy, Adventures of Bear and Munchausen, uh, Time Bandits, and Brazil. And I really like those movies. It's been years since I've seen 12 Monkeys, which so is coming out from Arrow pretty soon. And I've also seen Fear and Loathing. So, you know, I pretty much liked all his movies. Tideland. Terry Gilliam creates these weird fantasy worlds that, uh, you know, they're, they have this dark element to them. They're very strange and very uncomfortable, and that's what Tideland is. Tideland is a story told through a little girl's perspective. It's, it's really a lot of dark and creepy and scary things happening, but as it's told through the, the eyes of a little girl, almost in a way... Um, uh, rose-tinted glasses at times, but it's also, uh, you see it under underlining these dark things. A uh, young girl's parents kind of die, and she's left alone on this isolated uh, family farmhouse that's dilapidated and kind of collapsing. There's some uh, nearby people that she becomes friends with, um, sort of. Uh, this strange, strange woman who is pretty sadistic in a lot of ways, and her, her brother, who is mentally handicapped, and uh, she starts to form a weird relationship with these two and almost a, a kind of, um, I want to say semi-innocent relationship with the mentally handicapped boy. They have like a kind of boyfriend-girlfriend thing going on and she's about eight years old and he's grown and it's just very weird and uncomfortable. The whole movie, in fact, is uncomfortable, uh, gross, and just bizarre. That's how I would put it. Um Jeff Bridges in the movie uh, does a pretty good job. He has a good a good role, and uh, he's a heroin junkie. And it, it's strange. He's not likable, but you enjoy watching Jeff Bridges regardless. Um, like I said, a lot of the fantastical elements in this movie are really well done. The psychology of the little girl is actually done fairly well, too. She carries these four little doll heads on her fingers, and they all kind of, uh, learning to the commentary and the special features and things, you learn that they kind of represent different parts of her psychology. Like, one is who she wants to be, one is who she actually is, one is her darker side, and one is kind of reflected into what she thought of her mother, according to Terry Gilliam in the commentary. And I can actually see that in here. That was fairly intelligent for them to do that kind of stuff. Like, there's a lot put into it. There's lots of cool special effects. Lots of different things going on in the movie. Like I said, it's not lazy. It's well-made. It's, uh... You know when you see something that you know is a well-made film or they were doing they did what they wanted to do but you don't like what they're doing uh, at the same time like i don't necessarily enjoy thailand i i enjoy kind of seeing how the world would this dark weird world would be represented through a little girl's eyes but at the same time it also kind of bothers me watching it which is its intent but i also don't enjoy it at all it's not something that's entertaining it's a, it's a dark fantasy movie that uh is very kind of just uh off-putting in general and uh, sometimes I like that kind of stuff. Sometimes I don't. It's a very hard thing to balance. On the disc, there is, uh, like I said, a commentary. It's an older commentary from 2003. And uh, you learn Car Terry Gilliam's a madman. You can tell from like his previous movies, that, which I love. But he's just uh, very, he doesn't think like other people. And you, it's very obvious in this. It's, a, it's a, I think uh, he's with the producer on this. And they're, it, this is actually based off a book. You learn that. And they definitely put some Alice in Wonderland spin in here as well. Um and uh, there's also some old archival interviews with like Jeff Bridges and Jennifer Tilly and stuff like that. It's not, uh, I think it's mostly all the old stuff ported over from the old double disc DVD. But um, it is an interesting movie. And uh, I think if you like this kind of stuff, it's worth giving a spin. Uh, maybe watch the trailer and stuff and see if you would like it because it's not for everybody. It's not even really for me, but I do respect what it's doing. I think, I mean, I respect its filmmaking skills, but I don't necessarily love it myself. I think this is kind of a movie that's going to be for somebody. I don't really typically like hate movies. I don't like, you know what I mean? That aren't for me. I, I just don't 
want to really revisit them very much. And this is going to be one that people that if it if they think it's for them, they'll love it. If they see a lot of things in there that are different, which there is, they, they could fall in love with it or they could despise it. That's definitely one. So lead tra uh, tread lightly on this one and you'll know if you like it or not. And I think what I love about when people ask about how did you shoot those exteriors, how did you make them so beautiful, well, not, well the location for one thing is very beautiful. This film is seen through the eyes of a child. If it's shocking, it's because it's innocent. Gilliam's films are carefully constructed, and I assume he'll be very specific in the way he blocks and shoots a scene. And it was a nightmare. We shot again and again and again to try to get it working. Oh, oh there you go. We're just yeah. Through a bit. Yeah. Good. No, it's it, it, fine. It's another version. I'm next. But you found us the squirrel gun. She'll destroy me for sure. Okay, the next one here is American Guinea Pig Sacrifice by On Earth Films. Uh, this came in my uh, donation to Indiegogo. Um, and uh, I wasn't really sure what to think. This is by uh, an Italian uh, filmmaker and um, a couple. Um, the producer on this, he's done a bunch of stuff like House of Flesh Mannequins and a slew of Italian horror films. And uh, one of the actresses in his movies actually directed this one, Poison Rouge. So, you know, I was a little interested in checking this one out. It's very short. And... Um, Again, this is when uh, I'm going to sound very negative on this movie. This this movie is not for me anymore. Um, like I'll say, it's well shot. It has some nice setting, um, some like uh, nice locations later on in the movie. Um, they did do some research a lot into like uh, the sacrifice, sacrificial stuff. Uh, the special effects are good, and there's brave performances. Besides that, it's definitely not for me. The movie is about a man who's sacrificing himself to some sort of ancient god, and throughout a ritual he does, and there's uh, he's cutting himself up and doing different things, and with scarification and uh, castration and uh, putting holes in his head. It looks very good. It looks very gross. The effects are good. It's gross. But on top of that, this isn't the kind of stuff that disturbs me, and it's going for that kind of disturbing element. It's not that kind of thing that bothers me it's just to me uh, the movie also has a, a to me it's not it's not disturbing it's just not it's a special effects extravaganza and sometimes i like that sometimes i don't this time i'm not too big of a fan of it but i say if you like gore effects you'll like it but saying that there's some narration in the movie and um it's narrated in kind of like a, a angsty kind of like classy voice and any time I the narration comes off super cheesy to me, like cringeworthy, like I was like, oh, like I was like embarrassed for it. That's just the feeling I got, and I'm be, initial reaction being honest, and it has a lot of angst to it because the character they're kind of going with that he's a millennial type deal. He's obsessed with social media. He's upset about the Trump, uh, you know, administration. That kind of deal. He's they're they're playing into that and. I know that they're aware of it, what they're doing with the character, but it still doesn't change the fact that, to me, it comes across trite and cheap. That's just how I feel, like I said. And and the character's angsty. He's very angsty, and it's just... I, I wanted to roll my eyes so hard, like, a lot of the times. It's just... it just To me, it doesn't work. It comes across, like, cheesy and cringeworthy. But, like I said, a lot of people will dig it. A lot of people will enjoy it. And um, if you're, it, it's not like a bad, ma uh, poorly made film. Like the actor goes for it, the actress in here goes for it. They're not scared. They're not chickening out. It's not like they don't have guts. It, it, it's well lit. It, it, they, they do these like uh, the things that come back into. It. It's not like a 
poorly made movie, but I don't really care for the script or where it's going. It's doing what it wants to do, but I don't really want to see what it's doing because I don't see any value in it. There's no value in it for me, if that makes sense to anybody. Now, saying that, there is a commentary on here with uh, a couple guys, uh, Son, Son of Celluloid, and uh, they have a, um, I can't remember their podcast name, but they get drunk and talk about it. They love it. They point out a lot of things that I didn't notice, which helps me uh, appreciate it a little bit more. They're funny. They don't, <laughs> they made me laugh a couple times. They talk about Jim Varney. They get way off topic. They're very funny. As it goes on, they get more and more drunk. There's some behind the scenes on here, which is nice to see. There's a little bit of, I believe, a making of and whatnot. They show how they did a trick with the, um, uh, genital mutilation, which is kind of nice to see that somebody didn't really mutilate their genitals in the movie. But uh, it's a really hardcore uh, graphic stuff, and uh, if you see the trailer, you'll know if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, uh, it's my least favorite of the guinea pig movies. Uh, so far, Bloodshock sits on the top. I love, I actually really like Bloodshock. I think Bloodshock's awesome. And then I put Bouquet of Blood and Guts, Sung of Solomon, and then this one on the bottom of the American guinea pig movies. But yeah, that's so far, you know, it's not for me. Other people will love it. If you watch a trailer, you'll be like, oh man, if you want to see like just well-produced, well-made gore, then check out American Guinea Pig Sacrifice. Okay, the next one here is from Twilight Time. It's by the best, Sam Peckinpah. This is Killer Elite. Also on here, I'm going to talk about Noon Wine. But uh, Killer Elite uh, stars James Caan and uh, Robert Duvall and some other familiar faces. Burt Young, uh, Bo Hopkins, Gig Young, some uh, you know Peckinpah regulars. Uh, the Killer Elite, uh, it opens up by saying uh, this is a special group. Uh, is the questions, uh, this answering question Q&A thing, where it says, is there a special group that the CIA kind of hires out to do uh, certain things? And it's like, no. But if there was, would you tell us about it? No. And that's basically it. And even in the opening of the movie, it tells you that... Uh, uh, the idea of this is nonsense. Like he, was, somebody was afraid of getting in trouble. But uh, it follows this group that uh, it's kind of like a branch of the CIA or secret branch of the CIA that uh, basically protects uh, certain people from uh, being murdered in America while they're here. Uh, James Kahn and Robert Duvall are partners. They seem to have a long uh, relationship. They seem to have a jovial relationship where they get along. Their chemistry is pretty good in the movie. They're actually funny together. James Kahn is a classic actor. So is Robert Duvall. You know, they've been in tons and tons and stuff. And the only Peck and Pum movies they both were in. So that's pretty cool. Um, the music's done by Jerry Fielding. Or Fielding. I can't think. Fielding, I think. He did, you know, The Wild Bunch and a lot of other stuff. Pretty much did all Peck and Pum scores except, uh, you know, um, Getaway and maybe a couple others. But the music's pretty good in the movie, too. And, you know, unlike a lot of Peckinpahs, this isn't a Western. And it doesn't really feel like a Western here. It's more like, uh, and uh, what happens is there's a double crossing here, and it's James Caan healing and uh, basically trying to get back in tip-top shape to get kind of revenge for himself. But the uh, bureaucracy of the company and the crookedness kind of, um, you know, is also shown in here as well. Burt Young plays uh, an old friend of his that is definitely the guy who, uh, telling him a lot of this stuff. And Bo Hopkins plays a crazy guy like he always does. He plays a crazy guy in what tentacles, the wild bunch. Every time you see Bo Hopkins, you can expect a, a crazy kind of uh, uh, gung-ho kind of character. And that's definitely what he plays in here. 
Uh, there are some moments of pretty uh, nasty, like slow motion shooting. Uh, some guy gets shot in the head, which kind of took me by surprise. James Conn's really funny in it. He's really witty in it. Uh, he's really likable in the movie, to be honest. And uh, I, I enjoyed uh, the first half of this movie. Everybody always talks about James Conn, and they're like, he was so brave to be in misery and to be, you know, like this masculine guy, like in a bed and not being able to fend for himself. That's not. But he does this in this movie. The first half of this movie is James Conn, like hobbling around, falling down, and and being embarrassed and trying to get back up. There's a great scene that shows it in the restaurant you know so James Conn it wasn't new for him and he's good at it and he does it in this one too and you actually feel sorry for him and you like his character and um uh, and the, like the first half of this movie is like kind of a romance with him and a nurse and him getting back in tip-top shape and the second half of the movie is you know him kind of like protecting this um Chinese politician from uh assassination and there's lots of double crossing going on and that's pretty much the whole movie is it's not Peckinpah's best film but it is pretty solid. The action's decent, as always. Action's always good with Peck and Paw. It's like I said, it's it's um it's pretty cool. It doesn't have my favorite Peck and Paw cast, you know. I would have liked to see like my favorites, you know, like uh, a Ben Johnson or Warren Oates popping up would always been would been pleasant. But it's got some uh you know the good faces in here, good acting. It's all around solid movie, and uh, it ends a little bit different than you would expect. Uh, but it's it's not horrible, not horrible at all. But the one on here with it, Noon Wine, which is included on here, was made in 66. It stars Jason Robars, and it has Ben Johnson in there and LQ Jones, which is nice to see smaller roles. But uh, this movie is much more interesting to me. This was the movie that uh, Peckinpah made after Major Dundee. Major Dundee was kind of a big flop, and it was taken away from him and re-edited. We got an edition out now from uh, Twilight Time that is the re-edited, refixed up edition, and it, it's probably better than the uh, original edition that was released. But after that, he really couldn't get much work. And this is a TV movie he made, like I said, with Jason Robards in 66. And it does look like a TV movie, so you have to forgive it there. But the subject matter is so dark and so different. And this is... Th this is what got him the Wild Bunch, apparently, because it was so good that it got him funding for the Wild Bunch, which is probably his best movie, you know, objectively. I mean, <laughs> probably. But, um... The Noon Wine is a is a strange story. It follows uh you know Jason Robards. He runs this dairy farm with his kind of invalid wife and his two kids. This uh, Swedish uh, drifter kind of drops by and he uh, hires him as a farmhand. Uh, and the guy is very strange. Has a love for his harmonicas. There's something off with him. He's not very talkative. But over time they form a relationship and they depend they depend on him. He's very good at his job. He's very hardworking. And, and maybe Jason Robards is exploiting him a little bit. And throughout this movie you see that Jason Robards has a temper like. A lot of people do, and a lot of peck and paw characters do. And he has this underlining rage that's building. And his wife is, you know, uh, she she prides herself on being honest. She prides herself on being religious, being an honest, good person. And uh, what happens is, um, I don't want to give necessarily uh, anything away, but uh, Rail Bars... Um, does something that he shouldn't do and uh, it causes a catastrophic or a, a catalyst for all these other bad things to happen and it causes him to force somebody it shows his darker side and it's really really kind of scary and depressing and for a TV movie it goes places that a lot of things wouldn't go I actually was disturbed by it and, and saddened by it and that's this is the kind of stuff that disturbs me and saddens me and because it's real and and when I watch something like this is about a guy cutting himself up in a bathroom like okay I get it it's gross it's it's so much more immature than something like noon wine which is real dark humanity real on on tons of levels and you know manipulating people to do what you want them to do and trying to justify your actions and and realizing your the consequences of your actions and stuff like that it's just dark and uh, it's really good and jason robars is just one of those actors that his delivery and he's he's irreplaceable He's such a good actor. From If you watch him in Once Upon a Time in the West or Something Wicked This Way Comes or Ballad of Cable Hogue, he's just such a unique actor, and his uh, screen presence is so good. And uh, this is one of his best performances that I've seen. Uh, just really, really good movie. Um, and I recommend this release. I mean, New Wine doesn't look good. It was a TV movie, so there's not. I don't even know if it was shot on, you know, what, how they shot it or what or whatnot, or there's elements, or. but it's just a treat to see. You know, I never got to see it, but yeah, uh, Killer Lead actually looks good, and the sound was coming through pretty damn good as well. But uh, if you like, you know, if you like the stuff like The Getaway, it's more along the lines Killer Lead like that, but not as good. And if you want to see some of uh, like psychological Peck and Paw stuff, because he always has it in there. A lot of people, it gets overshadowed by like the. Um, the action, but there's lots of going on in a Peckinpah movie, and uh, there's a lot going on in New Wine. I'd really recommend checking that out. 
Mike Locken and George Hansen are friends. <laughs> they share just about everything. Hey, give me a hundred. Yeah, but what can you do with this stuff now? It's monopoly money. The same apartment. Here's shower and shave here. Here's your juice. You can shower there. The same women. What do you think of that little chick you just left in bed? Very nice. They even share the same job. They work for the CIA. They're part of the killer elite. James Kahn and Robert Duval in Sam Peckinpah's The Killer Elite, a very private enterprise that employs cab drivers. I used to think what I did was nice and necessary. What the hell do I know? Pretty girls, sportsmen. I got me tapped as a psycho. Executives. The CIA gives us 11% of our gross. Everybody get back. That's uh, plastique with a detonator. What should I do with it? See that bay right there? I'd run down there and chuck it in there. Listen, uh, officer, I I'd sure run. What a dumb James Kahn is locking. He was the best until he was broken. You're a cripple. You'll never be Top Gun again. Then he became even better. I'm coming back full duty. <laughs> Robert Duval is Hanson. They were close. Are you part of the organization? But not close enough. You just retired, Mike. Enjoyed it. But I can't blow up his best friend. Where's the morality in the world? If it hadn't been me, it would have been somebody else. Everybody pays you, don't they? Well, we're all idealists. James Kahn. Robert Duval. Arthur Hill. <laughs> Gig Young. Killer Elite. Okay, the next one is from Olive Films. This is Messenger of Death. This was a canon movie. This is directed by uh, J. Lee Thompson, who did a bunch of Bronson movies. And this is a Bronson movie, too. Uh, this also has a Bronson uh, regular, or I'll say um, Lee Ch J. Lee Thomas regular. I think he was did 10 to Midnight, too. Uh, Gene Davis from 10 to Midnight uh, in here. And it has some uh, big classic actors in here. John Ireland, <laughs> from I know from Satan's Cheerleaders, but he's in tons of westerns. And... Uh, Jeff Corey, who is in Devil's uh, Reign, and probably in tons of slew of other westerns and stuff. Uh, the Messenger of Death, uh, this is based off a book. Like I said, a lot of old movies, just if they were like mediocre, mid-sized movies, were based off books. But, um, and nobody complained about it, and they were pretty solid movies. And uh, Messenger of Death is that. I think it's pretty solid. It is a canon, so it's a little goofy, a little crazy, especially in the opening of this movie. A whole family, a Mormon family, is murdered in brutal fashion by this uh, stone-faced killer. And uh, that's a little crazy. But uh, Bronson is a reporter, and uh, he's trying to find the case. He's friends with the police detective, played by this, uh, the police detective. Uh, this guy plays a detective in Screwed and a bunch of other stuff, so it's nice seeing him in there. But uh, he's friends with the detective and kind of friends with the upper crust of the, the, to uh, the, the town. And he starts to dig into this, goes into Mormon country, realizes this is a strange sect of Mormonism. And they're kind of like, uh, they hate outsiders. They're a little bit aggressive and, and, and something weird's going on. He realizes there's some sort of blood feud going on. But uh, there's much more going. There's bureaucracy and there's corporate uh, espionage, stuff like that going on. And... Uh, Bronson is here to figure out what's going on. It's shot well. There's some nice scenery in here, no doubt. The acting's solid. And this is one of those movies that if it was shot uh, really badly, at times it does feel like a TV movie. It has the charm of a TV movie with violence and Bronson and some other things going on. But um, it does have the charm of a TV movie, but it is shot particularly better than a lot of these movies. And it has nice scenery. It has nice scenery. It, it uses it well. And... Uh, it has good cast. Like, it's always a pleasure to see Gene Davis. He's not in that very many movies. You know, Cruising, Black Eagle, this, and uh, Ten to Midnight are the only ones that come to mind. Brother of Brad Davis. Um, so, it's always nice to see Gene Davis pop up in a movie. Like I said, Jeff Corey, John Ireland, Charles Bronson. Uh, everybody in this is really good and really solid. Although, a lot of the people in the movie refuse to hold their breath when they're dead. See a lot of people breathing when they shouldn't be. But, uh... 
all around, it's a pretty solid movie. The score is a little, I guess the term they'd say is bombastic. It's a little loud, especially at the end of the opening. You're like, this is kind of weird. It's very religious and comes in hard and heavy. And you're like, this is so a little bit over the top for this. But all around, I think it's a fairly decent movie. And when people get shot, it's pretty graphic, uh, surprisingly graphic, especially for this kind of plot. It is a canon movie, and you can tell like that kind of stuff. It, it pushes it a little bit further than a normal movie like this would. Like I said, there's decent action. The ending is a little abrupt and a little crazy, and it leaves. It ends on such a dark note, and the credits roll that you're like, is that how we're going to do this one? You're a little surprised by it. But, you know, it's fairly solid. It's not Bronson's best performance. It's not Bronson's best work. Uh, he's a little old in it. I mean, and that's not usually, I, I mean, I like him in Death Wish 4 too, but this one, uh, it, it's not his best performance and it's not his best movie, but it's a solid Bronson outing and it, it's fairly enjoyable. I don't think there's any special features on the disc. It looks and sounds pretty decent. There's a trailer, that's it, I think. But that's Messenger of Death by J. Lee Thompson, who did White Buffalo. He did the follow-up with this. I think the one that came after this was Kindajite. I'm not going to say that pronoun uh, pronunciation correct, but he did a bunch of other ones. He worked with Bronson a lot. Death Wish 4, but... There we go. In the home of a people united by tradition, one family will be divided with a vengeance. Now, Charles Bronson is out to uncover the truth behind this mysterious cult. You're a journalist. You're not welcome here. So I'm not. He's out to stop the bloodshed between two families. Looks like we've got a live one here. What he discovers is a mystery that lies between a world of blind faith. How we worship is no concern of yours. And a world of blind ambition. <laughs> This is sacred land, my father's land. They want our water. Anybody here know of an outfit called the Colorado Water Company? You gotta make it look like an accident. We'll take care of it. Charles Bronson, messenger of death. Okay, the next one here is Low Life. This is by Scream Factory, or Shout Factory released this one. I think it is Scream, actually. And uh, the cover is saying all these quotes. Let me check it out. A ridiculously entertaining, worthy successor to Pulp Fiction. There is one of the year's ten best films. Uh, birth, movies, death. So that, I was like, okay, I'm excited. I heard good things about it on Shockwaves. So I put this in, and I did have a little high expectations. And for the first two-thirds of the movie, I was like, eh, that doesn't really live up to expectations. But by the end of the movie, I was getting all emotionally invested and uh, entertained, and I was like, what's gonna happen? And I was getting, uh, and there's this really heartfelt scene at the end, and then I was like, no, that lived up to expectations. So I had high expectations, and it lives up to him. Uh, Low Life is uh, told in like kind of three little segments, or is it four? I'm not necessarily sure, but it follows all these different Low Life characters. And I guess the director's intent was to try to make the, some of these Low Life characters seem a little bit more likable and interesting than you see them in a lot of other movies. We have, uh, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound really weird, and this is why the movie is so strange in the very beginning. We follow this uh, luchador um, named El Monstro, or I think it is Monstro, and uh, he's carrying out his family lineage. He wears this mask. He cannot take it off. He has a wife who has a who's pregnant and uh, she has a drug problem and uh, he basically works for this weird kind of scummy um, king this guy this all-around criminal does all sorts of has his fingers dipped in tons of different things and uh, we follow him around we see his story and how why he's so full of rage and anger and he blacks out and he's just insane character and we follow these two uh, low-life uh, convicts one who's just kind of released out of jail this uh, uh, you know this like white kind of gangster guy who has a swastika tattooed on his face and his uh, black friend so their their relationship they're do they're back and forth really funny they're both entertaining characters probably the strongest characters well the most uh comedic uh force in the movie that really works and we follow this uh this woman who is trying to save her husband they both have had a shady past 
all these characters intertwined. They're all related, and it comes together fairly well. And uh, one of the stories, the little stories, will end where the other one will. Then it will start a new one. It will be coming to a point, and then it will pick up where that one is, and you see where they all like cut up and meet up and stuff like that. And by the end of the movie, it all works fairly well. Uh, there's some nasty after practical effects in here, like people shooting themselves and what you see afterwards and stuff like that. People being cut up. So it's gory there. It's nasty there. There's some digital effects at the end. But by then, they're not great. But by then, they've already won you over. You're already invested, so you don't care. And that happens sometimes. But yeah, I, this comes together fairly well. It's emotional. It uh, you know, it sets stakes, and you get invested big time, and a lot, and, and it makes sense to you. And uh, there's lots of good stuff going on, and it's entertaining, and it, it it seems like a little scummy little movie too. Like it's in this small little area, and everything plays together well, and it doesn't seem forced. They set it up well. You don't see it coming because you're not looking for it. But when it happens, you're like, oh, they set that up well. It's it's set up well. It's acted well. It's a strange, unique movie with bizarre characters that somehow all seem to exist in this world without being fake. And it's cool. It's low life. Check it out. And I guess it is in that vein of like uh, people would say it's like a Tarantino ripoff nowadays. I don't know. It does have its own flavor, but it is pretty cool stuff. And I, I would recommend checking it out for sure. I enjoyed it. Damn. He needs an operation like real, real bad. And if you're certain she's a match, do it. Take my daughter's kidney. Done deal. Being the man of action that I am, I put it all in motion as soon as I received your frantic call. Padre, enséñame el camino del fantasma de la justicia divina. Damn it, monstro. Your Mexican nonsense has given me a headache. You know what your problem is? You can't give up on anything, even when it's time. I need to worry everything's gonna be okay. Oh, well, look at this. <laughs> Process the rest. <laughs> My boy. <laughs> what? Do you have a swastika tattoo on your face? Here we go. What are you mixed up in? Here's what you're gonna do for me. Mm -mm. I got two strikes and a swastika tattoo. Ain't no way I'm helping you kidnap some poor girl. You remember uh-uh from Greenlee? Remember how many pieces of him they found? That was Teddy being chill, man. That's Teddy. Being chill. Damn, G. I am in troubles. Help me, por favor. You gotta dump our ass. Dump her? It's a human being we're talking about here, man. Oh! You got shot. Oh, it's good idea. Amigos, bienvenidos al infierno. The baby's coming! You Nazi prick! Ma'am, not cool calling me a Nazi. You don't know my struggle. Okay, guys, the next one I'm here to review. I know you're probably wondering, why the shirt change? Well, sometimes you get these movies ahead of time and they have to be reviewed on a certain date or for before or after a certain date. So that's why the shirt change. But uh, the next one I'll be reviewing is Puppet Master, The Littlest Reich. Yes, this is like, what, the 13th or 14th Puppet Master movie. This is a little bit different. It doesn't follow the series that um, uh, Charles Band's been putting out since the late 80s. This is kind of a new take on it. It's kind of a, in a different universe, if you will. Um, this is by the directors of the guy, the, to the pair of directors who did the movie Wither, which was like, I believe, a Swedish uh, kind of Evil Dead style movie uh, a few years back, which is actually pretty cool, if I remember correctly. It's been a long time. Very gory. And uh, yeah, it shows in this one. This is from RLJ, our Image Entertainment. And uh, they were nice enough to send me over a screener to check it out. <sighs> I haven't watched a Puppet Master, I'm going to be honest, since Part 7, Retro Puppet Masters. So when I heard about the plot of this one, I was actually really excited to check it out. I'm a fan of Puppet Ma the Puppet Master movies uh, from a certain time. I loved them, grew up grew up with them. So uh, this one is a bit different. We have uh, Thomas Lennon, uh, Thomas Lennon, who stars in this, uh, Dangle from uh, Reno 911. Love seeing that. We have some other familiar faces in here, too. Barbara Crampton, uh, Uday Kier, Michael Paré. Uh, a lot of genre favorites, so that's nice as well. The plot of this one is a bit different from uh, the other Puppet Master, or any Puppet Master, for that matter. Uh, the plot follows... Uh 
Thomas Lennon, he's a comic book artist, kind of just recently got divorced. He has to move back in with his parents. Very, very typical comedy setup. He finds this old puppet that used to belong to his brother that is this weird kind of blade puppet, if you guys remember. They look a little bit different from the original series. And he starts to do some research and realizes these puppets were made by Andre Toulon. And Andre Toulon was... Uh, died in a mysterious circumstances in this crazy he was involved with these murders and he died in a shootout with police that's basically the plot of this movie there's a thing going on an auction and a convention about these puppets and they're going to sell a bunch of them so he shows up looking to sell it with his new girlfriend that was his childhood neighbor they're they're in love with each other constant sex so there's uh, some nudity in there and with his jewish friend um what happens is uh, all these people have these puppets, and uh, Toulon, uh, sort of from beyond the grave in a unique way, uh, brings these puppets back. Uh, Toulon was a Nazi, so he's a hateful, spiteful piece of crap. And uh, what happens here is all these dolls come to life and start killing all the people in the hotel, a lot of which happen to be African-American uh, people, homosexuals, or lesbians, it's more lesbians in this, and Jewish people and foreigners. So uh, the dolls start to kill all of them uh, because, of course, they're Nazis. <laughs> It's ridiculous. It's stupid. The gore is over the top. Uh, the kills are very mean spirited, but at times they're ridiculously funny. Fabio Frizzi does the score, and Craig Z. Zell, uh, Zeller, uh, who directed Bone Tomahawk and Hel Bra and Cell Block 99, wrote this movie. So we have all this going on for it. It has a lot of uh, talented people involved in behind the camera, in front of the camera, even before the damn camera started rolling. So there's that going on. Well, I say is the first two acts, especially the first act, I love the setup of this one. I loved uh, Udai Kier the backstory and all that stuff I liked uh, the science and stuff I like that they mentioned that uh, during the tour of the house that uh, demonology all these different things are involved with the puppets and, and they throw it in there so it's like how did they come to life who knows there's like a million things that Toulon was into so it could be any of these things or a mixture of a bunch of them I like that the puppet designs aren't particularly my favorite but uh, they have variants on like the blades those are pretty cool there's a slew of new puppets some are cool some are <laughs> garbage uh, and there's uh, some puppets that aren't in there. Uh, no Six Shooter, no Jester, no Leech Woman. Thankfully, no Decapitron. But uh, we do see some of the old favorites. Pinhead, Tunnler, Blade, um, uh, Torch. So they all pop up in here. Um, Tunnler is underutilized. Uh, the new puppets include an amphibian puppet, uh, um, Junior Fuhrer, uh, a flying one, um, a mantis one, all sorts of things. Uh, I kind of like that there's multiple ones in this one because we've seen the singularity thing before, uh, although the old story was cool with the souls and the puppets. But the kills are really what drives this movie for the first couple acts. And uh, one of the kills, uh, the flying, there's a flying puppet too, which is really cool. But I love the kills. And the comedy beats are really funny in this for the first uh, part, especially the best friend, the Jewish guy. He's great. He's hilarious. I laughed a lot during the first act of this movie. And the second act, I enjoyed quite a bit. The third act, to me, falls apart a little bit. And that feels like uh, they're, they're, they, it's a to-be-continued kind of storyline in this. And that reminds me of like the Return to Newcomb High, how they did that. Although Return to Newcomb High felt stretched out like they didn't have enough material. This movie feels like they cut out 20 minutes and then they're going to add that into the next one. Which... Uh, the last act is a little bit weak in this. But besides that, uh, Barbara Crampton gets some good lines in here. Michael Parre is funny. Uh, the gore is top-notch. The splatter's fun. This is a crowd pleaser, to be honest. Uh, you know, a lot of people are complaining, it's too mean-spirited, but it's so goofy and, and fun. And, and the puppets are bad. It's not like they're saying the puppets are right for killing these people. So I don't know. People are up in arms about the wrong kind of stuff. But I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really fun. Uh, I'd definitely be buying the Blu-ray or 4K release when it comes out. Um, it's one of my favorite favorite movies I saw this year like when I think back on it I like it more but I remember the first two acts I adored and then that last act I just was a little disappointed with and I, I kind of hurt me the special effects are great they're they're gnarly they're over the top uh I, I saw my friend Seb he posted it said he thought the Fabio Frizzi score was underutilized I wouldn't disagree with that I think it is kind of underutilized it is good and I, it's kind of hard to have a Puppet Master movie without that classic uh Richard Band score that we all know and love it's so embedded in our head and I really would have liked to hear that at least one time but uh the setup's great and uh i love seeing thomas lennon in it he's a funny guy he's got a great demeanor didn't care for the ending but uh i will definitely watch the new one when it comes out but that is uh the puppet master the littlest reich uh I want to see more. I'm excited for the sequel, the same as I am with Return to Nukem High, even if I was a little disappointed with their endings. Um, I want to see more. But uh, yeah, check it out. It's, it's really fun stuff.
warning. This motion picture is one of the most violent films ever made. There are 21 scenes of puppet violence and sadistic cruelty graphically shown. The content and subject matter may be upsetting for those under 18, those with weak hearts, and those of delicate nature. This cellar workshop is where André Toulon manufactured puppets. It is unclear how many of these puppets were made, though 60 or so of them are expected to be in Postville by tomorrow for the auction. That's not mine. I don't really know how that got here. Maybe it walked. Hello. Jesus. Well, you definitely seem like a toy that a maniac would make. What the? Why would anybody create a Nazi puppet? They're little, they're fast. Anne Frank was hiding in her attic, puppet could find her. Okay, guys, the next one we have here is the Weekly Western. Let's go. Why not? Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Say when. <laughs> not going to say the AK name and you're not going to you're not going to get mad about it okay but uh this stars Fred Williamson, RG Armstrong and William Smith. Those are the guys I recognize in it. Um love Fred Williamson. He's just one of the coolest guys around. Uh, Black exploitation star also pops up in uh, uh horror favorites from Dust Till Dawn. He pops up in stuff uh made famous by MASH and playing football of course. He's also in tons of black exploitation movies. Um so Fred Williamson is this uh, kind of like a uh, bounty hunter him and his partner and uh they end up going to this small town they find this uh thing off of one of their uh, bounties that says something about being a sheriff of this small town they go into this small town and uh fred williamson and his partner become sheriff and deputy they don't like this uh the townspeople rg armstrong is the mayor He's great in it. You guys know R.G. Armstrong. Prune Face, Stay Hungry, Predator, uh, the Peck and Paul movies. He's in tons and tons of stuff. Love R.G. Armstrong. Always have. Um, so uh, he's the mayor. He hates it. He is actually in cahoots with William Smith, who is the leader of the bandit that Fred Williamson and his uh, deputy are really after because he's a big payday. William Smith is in a bunch of stuff. He's in Red Dawn. Um, what else is he in? I think he's in Maniac Cop. He's a, he's a big, scary guy in this. Uh, but is he bigger and scarier than Fred Williamson? You'll have to see the movie. 
regardless, they kind of, uh, the movie is comedic at times. It's silly. It's almost like farcical. And it's definitely kind of doing that on purpose. There's lots of racism in the movie. All the townsfolk, are, of course, are horribly racist towards Fred Williamson. They don't want him to be sheriff. And he comes in and he kind of does a Clint Eastwood deal where he's taking what he wants and giving it to other people, less fortunate people and whatnot. But what this movie does, um, which is kind of crazy because we have these comedic elements. It'll get dark. It'll get pretty dark in the movie where characters will die that you don't expect to die and, and they're done in dramatic fashion. You're like, wow, that's kind of crazy. Um, it's not particularly gory or anything like that. Lots of people get shot, but they just go down. You know, we spaghetti Western style. I have no problem with that um, in this kind of movie. It, it's an entertaining movie. Uh, the bad guys are bad. They're scary. They're intimidating. The acting's pretty good. Fred Williamson's cool as shit. He always is. Um, and I do enjoy the movie. It's pretty cool stuff. The bad guys are goofy and dumb and they make fun of them at, at the same time. <laughs> I love how RG Armstrong in here is like the end of the butt end of everybody's jokes and stuff. He's just like kind of pushed around by everybody. He's like Weasley and it's weird to see him like that. And then when you look at him in something like Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, he's damn scary. It's like the complete opposite. But, uh, yeah, regardless, Boss is really fun. I would really recommend checking it out. It's like, you know, black exploitation Western, which is cool. And, uh, there's an interview on here with Fred Williamson, which is great it's a uh, old from the old dvd but he talks about you know I, when i made movies i set my own standards i get the girl i don't die i get the girl if i want her i don't die and uh, whatnot he pretty much talks about what why he did this movie and uh you know and whatnot it's a nice interesting interview about his career about his life about boss um I really enjoyed that. There's also an interview, I think, with uh, the producer on here. Uh, he goes into depth about the director, who's Jack Arnold, who did Creature from Black Lagoon, about how they got this made, how Fred Williamson brought, wrote this, wrote the script and everything like that, a 12-page script, and brought it to them, and they wanted to make it. Uh, really nice, interesting thing. There's a little tribute to Jack Arnold in here. It's a nice release. I thought it looked pretty good. I've never seen it before, so I can't compare it to previous editions, but uh, it's a DVD and Blu-ray combo. It's a pretty cool Western movie, especially if you like Fred Williamson. He's one of those guys it's just too damn cool uh for school he's just one of those guys he's, and you can tell he's smart man he's just like one of those guys that's gonna succeed he gets what he wants in period he's just uh, he's smart he's clever he's good at everything he's just one of those guys that's good at everything and uh you could tell but uh boss good stuff pretty entertaining enjoyed it nice release from vci they call him boss boss nigga they rode into a white man's town Bringing black man's law. He's black. He's brutal. He's boss. Fred Williamson is boss nigger. They call him boss. Boss nigger. I just swore in your new deputy. Made myself the sheriff. Being called a nigger in public. Now that's twenty dollars or two days in jail. <laughs> Take your filthy black hands off me, nigger! He, he just locked up the bank president! Well, you all been hunting black folks for so long, we just want to see what it felt like to hunt white folks. Part legend, part devil, <laughs> all man. That's just to satisfy your curiosity. Good morning, gentlemen. It's my pleasure to tell you uh, that... Sir, you are interrupting our breakfast. We never discuss business while we're eating. Where'd you learn to talk like that? I've been wanting to say that to somebody for eight years. My slave master said that to me once. It sounded so pretty, I never forgot it. <laughs> we got that nigga, let's go! I ain't leaving this town till I get me Jed Clayton. Fred Williamson is boss nigger. Nervio Martin, his deputy. They call him boss. They call him boss. Boss nigger. You so bad. They call him boss. They call him boss. Boss nigger. Okay, guys. 
we're going into the VHS Voyage. And I'm sorry I don't have the VHS for you, but here's the bootleg of Terragram. You guys know I'm a sucker for anthologies. I love anthologies, okay? So uh, I had never seen this one. I believe it's late 80s. It's three stories, and uh, it's narrated by James Earl Jones as the voice of, what is it, Redemption or Revenge? I don't remember what he is. Uh, let me see. I bet it says it right on the back. Um, he is the, uh, I can't see it, uh, but he's re Retribution. He's the voice of Retribution. But it basically is just like this lightning talking in the sky, and he basically t uh, folds out the stories. And these three Twilight Zone style stories come out, and they all the characters in this receive terror, these receive uh, telegrams from this guy, and they sign for it. They're not telegrams, but they receive this paper, they sign for it, they get this gift that pertains to what happens in the story. The three stories are all pretty cool, pretty unique, pretty fun. The first one is probably the most clever. What we have here is the show chauvinistic, weird, uh, jerk, drug-using director that nobody likes. He's an asshole. He's all about exploiting women in his movies and doesn't give them any substance in the movies. What happens here is, um, of course, um, after a fight on set, he signs the telegram. This guy shows up and signs for a package. It's his old scripts. He starts to read them. He gets thrown into this crazy world of his old scripts of like where everything's flipped. All the uh, the the gender roles are reversed. So now instead of all the men being like uh, piggy bikers that are exploiting women and stuff, it's the women exploiting men. It's really fun. It's really funny. And uh, he has to face off against his, the killer from his movies. But I really enjoyed it. I thought it was funny. I thought it was witty. It felt like the episode of the, the Twilight Zone movie with Vic Morrow where he's that bigot and he gets sent back through all those different times and has to face what the people he made fun of or that he ridiculed faced. It's like that in a way, but it's definitely more tongue-in-cheek and goofy. But uh, there's times when he meets up with these two, uh, these uh, like... Uh, these girl mechanics, they they are overacting terribly in that. He runs into these two would be like kind of rapist women who are basically just uh, you know manhandling him and making fun of him. And then he even runs into like a, a gang of biker chicks that have men on leashes. So it goes completely over the top. Really enjoyed that one. Uh, the ending on this is okay. They all kind of have that little ending uh, on the end that you're just like, eh, not too good. The second one follows the story of. Uh, of um, this uh, nasty reporter who has a hit and run accident. Right off the bat, I was like, is this gonna be like the hitchhiker from Creepshow 2? But it's a little bit different. She hits this young boy and uh, who's carrying this like little uh, jack-in-the-box toy. Um, and what happens to her is she doesn't tell anyone, has her promotional party, goes home, and the jack-in-the-box is delivered to her at some time, I think right before she goes home. She uh, throws it in the trash compactor, and of course this thing keeps haunting her, and what comes out is this the, the little boy as a zombie who's making wisecracks and saying gross things. He's a puppet. It's hilarious. I love it. And he's saying all these things to her and making jokes. And of course there's, you know, She's going to pay for what she did. I'm not going to give too much away there. Uh, it's really goofy, really fun. Enjoyed it. And this one has the best ending. I kind of liked it. The last one here is kind of similar to, um, I guess, House in a way. But uh, more if the guy, if William Cat played an asshole in House. Uh, we have this complete monster. This guy is a jerk off. He's going through a divorce. Um, and you realize what he did something to somebody in the past. He uh, was in college and he was snitching on people that skip the semester to go back home or whatnot. And this is during the Vietnam War. And what he did this is he ratted this guy out and this guy got sent to the Vietnam War and uh, he gets his journal in the mail. And uh, pretty soon he starts reading the journal and the dead soldier comes back and takes him into Vietnam with him. Kind of reminds me of that uh, Twilight Zone episode again that I was talking about with Vic Morrow, the movie segment, and also the from House. And what happens is he has to go through Vietnam while this uh, zombie, kind of similar to the American werewolf in London zombie, uh, his best friend is kind of, uh, you know, egging him on and making fun of him and torturing him and making him pay for what he did as a in real life being an asshole. This one's good too. The ending is a little little corny. I think they should have cut ended it a little sooner. But all three stories are cool. All three stories are solid. I liked all of them. They're all tongue in cheek, kind of crazy and over the top. The special effects are great. They're gory. They're gooey. It's good stuff. It's one of the better anthologies I had seen that I haven't seen in a long time. So I'd recommend this one. I think it's really cool. Teragram. If you can find it, it's it's well worth your time. Here is where evil is stamped and posted. Fate is wrapped and sealed. For here, the darkness in your soul is not a shapeless void, but a horrifyingly real package of your own creation. A package that is not a deliverance, but a reckoning. For this package holds the consequences of your past. A past you are forced to accept when you sign next to the X.
If you've done evil, then evil will find you. Be prepared to receive a special delivery. In three frightening tales of retribution, Alan Smythe's dark past is about to trap him in a place of his own creation. To be tormented by a lunatic killer and terrorized by characters from his own scripts. Angela Pandorus committed a secret crime that's about to catch up to her. You've already paid full price for this package. She's just a signature away from being a victim of her own lost conscience. Yes. For her terror has just begun and her past is about to explode. Veterans Day. Real biggie. Right up there with Arbor Day and Groundhog Day. An old friend is about to pay Eric Keller a visit. What kind of crap is this? This is no joke. that frightened him most. A past he must now live out. <laughs> Can't you see I'm not a soldier? It's all a mistake. I'm not supposed to be here. Help me. To receive your package, all you have to do is sign right next to the X. Terrorgram. Starring James Earl Jones as the voice of retribution, J.T. Wallace, Michael Hartson, Jerry Anderson, Linda Carroll Toner. Terrorgram, when your past becomes a present. Okay, the next one is the Pick a Movie, and this was picked by Nick Mua. He gave me a choice of Death Watch or Dead End. I actually watched this on Shudder, and I liked it so much I ordered the DVD right away. Okay, this follows uh, Ray Wise and Lynn Shade and their two kids, and they're driving to their grandma's house or one of the, the Lynn Shade's mother's house for Christmas. So they have all the presents. Also, the boyfriend of the, the daughter is in here as well. They're arguing... Uh, and uh, the little boy is a jerk. They all are kind of, you know, not the best. They're realistic people, but they're not the nicest people. And uh, I've never seen Ray Wise play this, but I, everything Ray Wise is in, he's great. Uh, from Suburban Gothic to RoboCop to Digging the Marrow. Ray Wise is great. Lynn Shade is the same way. She's always good. These two are great. They play husband and wife off each other perfectly. But um, this is a road whore. And uh, they're driving down this uh, road. He decides to take the back roads. They get lost. Something weird's going on. They have to stop for this woman in the road who's carrying a baby. And before long, people are getting picked off in strange ways, being taken away in a dark hearse. And that's the plot of the movie. It has some nasty, gory moments in here and uh, some really cool stuff. Uh, the dialogue is all hilarious. I laughed out loud several times, uh, and it's it's the kind of dialogue that people actually say. It's not really stupid. And there's some really great jokes in here, some editing, but it's not a horror comedy. It just has funny moments because the characters are funny and the things they say are funny. And some of the... the comment the jokes in here are really great like at one point uh two of the characters are like i'm not getting back in that car and then hard cut to them sitting in the car love that kind of stuff that's just funny that's just good writing and uh good editing but uh ray wise and lynn shades back and forth in this movie arguing with each other is so good ray wise his anger his frustration is is unmatched he just feels real he's very annoyed throughout the whole situation and uh as you, the movie goes on it seems like this road is provoking them to say things that they normally wouldn't say and it's starting to let fan dark secrets come out and things like that and uh as it, they get picked off more and more as it goes on and until there's just one final person left and uh the twist at the end you kind of see it coming there's no real way about it but at at the end they let you know that this isn't all necessarily a fantasy and i like that uh 
I'm iffy on the ending, but besides that, I think it's I think it's wonderful. I think it's great. I think it's scary. I think it's weird. I think it's shot well. I, I think it's contained and road horror. I just think they do everything perfect. It's five, six actors in a whole movie. It's creepy. It does like they keep going back to the same place. It's one of these movies that uh, you know. It's not necessarily like a ghost story. It's just kind of a a, a mind screw, uh, like well acted good movie that has some great moments in here like I like I said I laughed out loud a lot and I liked it so much I turned around I was like I got to have that in the collection it's just good stuff and it's a movie that passed me by I did I always heard people mention it they talked about it. I think I think JP and Moods and all them on the 22 shots of Horcast I'm not sure if Jeremy likes it but they all enjoyed it and uh, and uh, I heard people never heard a bad thing about it but I just never seen it but I never heard also the praise that I think it actually deserves like I said it's it's acted immensely well and it's shot well there's nothing wrong with this movie at all to me except maybe that ending is just a little shaky but i think i i, I can get over it I, and I, it's not how it it's not what happens it's how it unfolds is what kind of is just like eh, you could have done a little better than that well I, without spoiling anything there's one of the characters in the movie and i was like well but i like that the hearse drives away and the people are trapped in it that are supposedly dead it's just really kind of twisted and uh at times as well as it is funny and just creepy creepy funny and twisted that's how i'd say it but uh, really good stuff. Is anybody else just like the least bit freaked out that we are the only car on the road right now? It's 7.30 already, darling. Yes, I'm aware of that, Laura. I thought we'd come to a junction by now. Stop! I saw a woman in the forest. Tripping out. Oh my god! What the hell was that? <laughs> you guys suck. I saw what are you talking about? I saw Brad in a car. Who are these people in the woods? Don't come over here for God's sake. I'm pregnant. I smoke pot. Talk about a merry fucking Christmas. What if she gets it first? Who? Lady in white. Don't worry. She's dead. No! You bitch! Laura! Laura, I'm just kidding! I'm gonna... Okay, guys, now that we got to the pick a movie, I don't remember who picked next time. Oh, it was uh, Cody Par... Parwicka. Parwicka, and he picked uh, Beyond the Gate. Gates, which is the IFC one, which I do have, so that'll be next. If you ever want to enter the pick a movie, all you got to do is leave a comment on the Screaming Toilet page, my YouTube, and tell me uh, you want to be entered in. You will stay in the hat until you're drawn, or the bag, so don't re-enter until you're drawn. Who's going to be in here? We got uh, Frank... Edstein Horror Freak. So I think that's a YouTube name. Uh, let me know uh, what you want me to review. And uh, I'll get on it for the week after next. Okay, guys. Let's get into the Q&A. Same thing. If you ever want to ask a question on the Q&A, just leave it on my YouTube or the Screaming Toilet page, and I'll get to it. Uh, John Willem, speaking of friends, who are your favorite horror movie duo? Abbott Costello, Tucker and Dale? <sighs> That's so hard. Uh, favorite duo. You know what? Those two that you named are great. I love Tucker and Dale. I love uh, when the guy's looking for the college kids. Uh, we For a short time, I lived in a college like like area years back. And uh, I just always said I wanted to go outside and be like, college kids! Hey, college kids! Just when, uh, what is it? I remember, I think it said uh, Dale goes out there and screams all that. I love that part in that movie. But Abba Costello are priceless, too. But uh, you know what? I'll go. Just uh, one that you didn't mention here is uh, what about the duo? I guess they're a comic duo in um, Night of the Creeps. I love their interactions together, the two friends, JC, and I can't think of the other guy's name. Tim Hayes, you mentioned John Carpenter movies during the update, not having seen any that are bad. Have you ever seen Dark Star? Yes, I have seen Dark Star. I actually enjoy Dark Star. Uh, it does feel more Dan O'Bannon than uh, John Carpenter, uh, but uh, I enjoy it. I think it's fun. I think it's a nice little, you know, you got 2001 Space Odyssey and Dark Star, then Alien. It, it feels like the right way to go, you know what I mean, if that makes any sense. Not saying that Dark Star is nearly as good as Alien or 2001 Space Odyssey, but you know what I mean. See that progression of space movies. Nick Mua. 
Which movie really captured your attention and imagination when you were a kid and still holds up now? Uh, I loved Monster Squad. Still like it. Uh, there's lots. I, I mean, I watched a lot of horror movies and adult movies when I was a kid that captured my fascination. And uh, they not all of them hold up as well as they do, but a lot still do hold up. I was always infatuated with Nightbreed and Hellraiser. and uh, But, um, you know, always loved the Goonies, Little Monsters. I'm still naming ones that I think are good still. Monster Squad. Um, yeah, stuff like that. I, I pretty much like that stuff. It all captured my attention. Would zombies and outer space film work, or would it be just like Jason X doll and painful to watch? Um, I don't know. I mean, space zombies, in a way, isn't kind of a, gal a ghost of Mars uh, space zombie thing. I know they're kind of like Mar like dust that goes in people, but it, it's kind of the same setup. I know a lot of people hate ghost of Mars, but I really like it. So I think space zombies would work fine. Does the fact that the same actors keep popping up in horror films ever take you out of the movie? Not necessarily, but if it is one of those movies that just has like 30 of these indie actors, like not indie, but like, like there's like some horror actors now. Like I don't want to give any names. Sometimes you see their names and you're like, this is going to be good because they always turn out good work. Sometimes you see their names and you're like, they sometimes they're iffy. Sometimes they're there to cash their paycheck. And there's like two dozen names that you'll see on a movie and be like, okay. You know, I don't want to say that, but there's there's a time when I would get movies for actors all the time, and now, now I see their name, and it's like, nope, unless I hear they're good in it. What would you do if you found yourself face-to-face -face with a cannibal in the wild? Am I in the jungle? Am I tired? Does he look like he's coming after me? I mean, if he looked like he was going to kill me, and I was surrounded by cannibals, I'd if I was like South America, I'd have to. Uh, if I could get the up the uh, the drop on him and kill him, I'd have to eat his heart, just to show the other cannibals I'm at business, because they'd be watching. Because I mean, if there there's a bunch of cannibals or something in one seat, you gotta you gotta show your dominance in the in the jungle, or you're gonna get killed. But I probably would just get killed by the cannibal, or I'd be so tired and I'd probably die before that. I'd fall in some like quicksand or something, or get bit by some weird parasitic bug and pass out or something. So I don't know. But uh, let's hop into the update. Okay, guys, let's hop into the update. Let's start off with the vinegar syndromes. We got Wonder Woman. Nice hard slipcase here. Not seen this. Looks pretty damn cool. I'm going to slide it off for you. Love Vinegar Syndrome. Have all their Blu-rays thus far. We'll continue to buy all their Blu-rays till the end of times. Or I die or they die. One or the other. Shot. Again, let's see the back of this bad boy. We got the front, the alternative cover. I've never heard of this movie. That's why I love Vinegar Syndrome. They always are releasing stuff I've never heard of. I don't even know what this is. And then, uh, Dear Dead Delilah, or what is it? Is it Delilah? Wasn't this one actually a, a, a trauma too? I can't remember. I think it was. I think I had this on an old release somewhat. But, uh, again, not super familiar with this movie either. I think I had it in one of those trauma multi-packs. Multi and I think I, or I confuse it with the deadly, uh, Daphne's Revenge. Okay, let's hop into... This is funny to me. Uh, I got this from Bull Moose. It's a Scream Factory release. It's still sealed, but they put it backwards. I haven't opened it yet. I'm born uh, with James Karen. I remember this seeing the trailer for this. This is one of the Corman ones they did, but it's backwards. It's upside down or backwards, yeah, uh, but the cover. But it doesn't bother me. It's funny. I'll switch it when I, um, when I open it up. Uh, we have Brain Scan from Scream Factory. I grew up watching this movie. I love this movie. Uh, good stuff. Um, Edward Furlong, video game horror. I'm sure the special effects, the digital effects are really dated, but I really always dug that one. Another one I really loved, uh, Return of the Living Dead Part 2 by Ken Wiederhorn, director of Shockwaves. Uh, yeah, I love Return of the Living Dead Part 2. In fact, the first three I love. The first one is like one of my top favorite movies, if not top like two favorite horror movies ever made. But uh, the second one is Blast. Um, and I love this as a kid, and I still love it. Tom Matthews still, uh, James Karen's in here, Suzanne Snyder. Um, who else is it? Dana Ashbrook. Um, the uh, old man in here is also uh, the original of Morty Seinfeld from the pilot of Seinfeld. So I love uh, Return of the Dead 2. Can't wait to watch special features. The soundtrack's on there corrected. The Fright Night Eureka edition. Um, I love Fright Night. Uh, this is a 4K scan. I've uh, not had a chance to watch this release yet, but uh, Rika usually does pretty good work. Man, who doesn't love Fright Night? Come on. It's great. Tom Holland movie. Love it. 
Then we got some uh, from the Ronin, was it Ronin sale? Bloodthirsty Butchers, uh, Andy Milligan movie. They had like a 50% off if you bought five. I bought six. So, yep, not seen that. Got those a good price. We got uh, Torture Dungeon, another Andy Milligan movie. I don't know. Let me know if these are worth watching. The Man with Two Heads. This is the second two-head movie I bought. I still need another one. There's like three of them. Incredible Two-Headed Transplant, The Thing with Two Heads, The Man with Two Heads. Yep, there's The Man with Two Brains. There's lots of stuff going on with that. Then we got uh, The Witchmaker, which I believe had something. LQ Jones wrote this or produced this. But a uh, nice slipcover. Looks cool. Code red. And we got The Haunting of Morella. I think this is a Jim Wynorski. I, I held off on buying this because this is not the unrated edition. But uh, I don't think we're going to ever see that on Blu-ray. Or DVD for that matter. So, Haunting Morella. There we go. Strip to Kill. Uh, I got to give it up. To, I've not seen this one. But I got to give it up to Ronin Flix. I ordered this. It came. The, the package came like quick. And for the first time ever, they uh, made a mistake. They actually sent me the wrong movie. And uh, I contacted them with two days or uh, three days later. They had me the new replacement. And uh, they, they paid for the shipping to send it back and everything. They were super fast at fixing it. And I ordered from them all the time. Only one mistake. And they fixed it super fast. So, got to give them credit for that. I walked in a... a a family video and uh yeah i ended up walking out with like 10 movies and it was 17 dollars. i think the guy did not charge me the right price but i don't know maybe you like me i don't know we have nurse 3d uh, i don't know he said something about this only being a 3d disc but uh, i wanted to see this i hear mixed things about it looks fun uh dog eat dog which i bought the dvd but the blu-ray these were like listed at 250 a piece for blu-rays and these are stuff that i didn't really care about having like in mint condition so i grabbed them what else we got? Stakeland 2 for $250. I couldn't pass that up. I really liked the first one. Dark Sky release. Figured for that price, why not? No One Lives. I had the DVD this too. I'll just toss it in here with it. But I uh, heard good things about this one. It's supposed to be surprisingly actually pretty good. Then we got Human Centipede 3. I tried to watch like a few minutes of this on Netflix. I could not do it. I do not like this movie. But uh, yeah. Like the, the second one quite a bit. Open Windows. I have this DVD as well. But Nacho, uh, Nacho, whatever, I forget his last name is. He did Chime Crimes. That was cheap. And The Rambler, which I also have a DVD of. This is by the same guy, I think, who did The Oregonian. Not seen that. And then we have some DVDs here. All those last Blu-rays, those last seven Blu-rays, and these three DVDs were $17. So He Never Died, Henry Rollins. I don't know if I have this DVD already, but for the price, I was willing to fight again. Uh, Zombies, Cameron Romero presents. Yeah, Tony Todd. Zombies. I don't know. And then we have <laughs> Carnivore, Werewolves of London. I don't know what I was doing. These were like listed as like a dollar or two for three or something like that. So I grabbed it. I don't know. But I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the update. Back to the video. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. And as always, you guys have a good one.